Hello again folks. In this presentation we'll review basic chemistry and revisit the themes of shape and energy as handles to understanding chemical and biochemical reactions. We'll begin with atoms and the elements essential to life, remind ourselves that the distance of electrons from the atomic nucleus is related to their energy of position or potential energy and their energy of motion, kinetic energy. We'll review the different kinds of chemical bonds and how they play roles in cell structure and function. We'll check out carbon and water again and review the concepts underlying macromolecular metabolism. Again, the themes are energy and shape. So, to remind ourselves, the atomic number of an atom is equal to the number of protons in its nucleus. The number of electrons orbiting the nucleus is balanced by the number of protons. In the atoms of elements common to life, the number of neutrons and protons in the atomic nucleus is the same. The mass of atoms is the sum of the masses of protons plus neutrons at one Dalton each. At only one two thousandth of a Dalton each, electrons don't contribute much to atomic mass and so generally uh, are not included in the atomic mass number until you get to the higher elements. We use the convention shown here in the carbon and hydrogen examples to indicate the element by its symbol, its atomic number, the left subscript, and mass, the left superscript. To understand how the energy and location of electrons in atoms and molecules explains their chemical properties, we model atoms in two ways. The shell model shown here emphasizes the potential and kinetic energy of electrons. The further from the nucleus, the faster the electrons move. The orbital model emphasizes the space occupied by electrons around the nucleus. Each orbital can contain zero or one or two electrons. So you might recall that more than one orbital may contain electrons at the same energy level what I just said. In this illustration, electrons are shared between atoms in these covalent compounds in orbitals that give the molecules their shapes. The space-filling models along the bottom of the slide emphasize the different molecular shapes. Note that in methane, CH4, the four unpaired electrons in four orbitals around the carbon atom are being shared with electrons from each of the hydrogens. This forms a shape, the tetrahedron, outlined as a three-sided pyramid in the illustration. Only carbon can form this shape, and then only when it shares its four electrons with four other atoms or chemical groups. Here's a part of the periodic table, which organizes the elements in order of atomic number, in rows, and of mass, in columns. The colored elements are found in human cells. The pink ones are the most abundant, but all of the others, except possibly the uh, yellow ones, are also important. Some, like phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, zinc, magnesium, and manganese, although present in only trace amounts, are in fact crucial to life. The number of unpaired electrons in an atom's outer shell, or its valence, determines the chemical reactivity of the element. The valences of the elements used by cells range from 1 to 4. At the far right you can see the noble gases which have no unpaired electrons and so have a valence of 0. Here's another look at the shell model of an atom. When an electron absorbs a photon of light as shown here or an equivalent amount of electrical or any other kind of energy the electron becomes excited and jumps to the next higher shell, next higher energy level. When the light or electricity is turned off, the electrons will return to their so-called resting state, that is to their original energy level or energy shell. In doing so, there they go, they might release energy as heat, or they might release energy as light or fluorescence, like the light you see coming from a fluorescent light bulb or from a sample excited by UV light in a fluorescent microscope. When atoms interact, they form one of three major kinds of bonds, covalent bonds, hydrogen bonds, and ionic bonds. Covalent bonds are the strongest. It takes the most energy to break them. Although weaker, hydrogen and ionic bonds are responsible for many crucial molecular interactions in cells. 
An interaction between two molecules could involve many hydrogen or ionic bonds, making, in fact, for very strong attachments between or within molecules. Covalent bonds are represented by the dash between the atoms. Each bond represents a pair of electrons shared by the two atoms. Two atoms can share more than one pair of electrons. Single and double bonds are common enough, and you may have seen some examples of molecules with triple bonds, such as hydrogen cyanide. Intermediate covalent bonds occur especially in carbon ring structures. Here's the benzene molecule. In the illustration on the left, we've drawn the six electrons involved in the double bonds as if they were in fixed positions relative to specific carbons. But since these electrons are actually shared equally by all of the carbons in the ring, the stippled circle of electrons in the benzene ring shown on the right would be a more accurate representation of the molecule. Covalent bonds may also be nonpolar or polar. When atoms share their valence electrons equally, they form nonpolar covalent bonds, as in the hydrogen and methane gas molecules shown here. In water, the oxygen atom is much larger than the hydrogen atoms. Oxygen's larger nucleus thus draws the electrons from the hydrogen atoms more closely to its nucleus. The result is the oxygen acquires a partial negative charge. Each hydrogen, left with only its proton, has a partial positive charge. There we go. The Greek letter delta is used to indicate partial charge. Because of their partial charges, water molecules attract one another and come together as shown here. The interactions between water molecules results in the formation of hydrogen bonds. The millions of H bonds holding together a drop of water accounts for water's high cohesion, in fact the tendency of water to stay liquid at normal temperatures. And here it is. In the same way, there is strength in numbers in the millions of hydrogen bonds holding two strands of DNA together in a double helix. Remember also that water is a good solvent. It can attract other polar covalent substances, as shown on the left, or charged surfaces of macromolecules like a protein, as seen on the right. Proteins that attract water like this are called hydrophilic or water-loving. Many ionic compounds are readily soluble in water. Here, as a reminder, is NaCl, or sodium chloride, formed by the ionization of sodium to Na+, which gives up an electron, and of chlorine to chloride, which accepts an electron, the one lost by sodium. The Na+, and Cl- ions form ionic bonds in a regular array to form salt crystals like the one illustrated here. When added to water, the partial charges on the hydrogens and oxygens in the water are powerful enough to bind the chloride and sodium ions respectively, pulling the salt crystal apart and dissolving it, as illustrated on this slide. From your chemistry courses, you may remember that not all salts are equally soluble. Can you explain why that's the case? Again, we might have an opportunity in class to discuss this, and uh, by the way, anytime I say that in one of these presentations, feel free to bring it up if I do not in a face-to-face -face meeting. Now let's take a closer look at the molecules of life, or organic molecules. We'll see that carbon is the smallest atom in the periodic table with the largest number of alternative bonding possibilities. In other words, it has a valence of four and can share four electrons with as many as four different other atoms, or molecular groups. Because of this, the carbon atom is able to participate in molecules of diverse shape. It could do this even before the origins of life. Once again, the theme is shape. OK, isomers. These are molecules with the same molecular formula, but different shapes, as shown here. At the top of the slide are two structural isomers of C4H10. Geometric isomers occur when the same atoms or chemical groups can be on the same side or on opposite sides of a double bond, we say cis or trans respectively, as shown in this case for C4H8 in the lower part of the slide. 
and there are the hydrogens on either opposite or the same sides on the left and right in this illustration. Again, different shapes. A third kind of isomer occurs around individual carbons in organic molecules, further increasing the diversity of their shapes. This is the optical isomer or enantiomer. Recall the tetrahedral shape of orbitals around a carbon atom. This shape forms when four different atoms or chemical groups form covalent bonds with the carbon atom. The two molecules on this slide look alike, but in fact they are different. You could prove this to yourself by making them with a ball and stick modeling kit, or just watch this animation. It highlights the fact that the molecule on the left really is different from the one on the right, and in order to make the two molecules the same, you would actually have to break some bonds and make some new ones, as shown here. We say the carbon is an asymmetric carbon, or an asymmetric center. Another word we use sometimes is chiral. So optical isomers form around an asymmetric or chiral carbon. Clearly not all carbons in a molecule are going to be asymmetric. Again, carbon-based molecules lead to a maximum number of different shapes because of its ability to participate in isomeric forms of molecules. Carbon was selected as the basis of organic molecules precisely because of this asymmetry that I've illustrated. Its ability to form a maximum number of different covalent bonds and thus allow nature to experiment with diverse molecular shapes in coming up with the molecules of life. This chemical experimentation began long before the first cell ever formed on this earth. We need to talk about one more thing. A common theme in the chemistry of life is the creation of large molecules or macromolecules from smaller ones. Most macromolecules are polymers, and they are built from monomers or monomeric subunits. You probably already saw polymer synthesis by dehydration reactions and polymer breakdown by hydrolysis. So this slide illustrates generic polymer formation by dehydration synthesis. In this synthesis, a hydrogen and an OH is removed from the participants to make water. That's why the reactions are called dehydration reactions, or sometimes condensation reactions. On the bottom of the slide, a polymer is being broken down by hydrolysis. In this reaction, water molecules are added across the molecule. Here they go. Water goes in, and the monomer comes out. This is the reaction that characterizes the digestive breakdown of what we eat, as well as cellular recycling of its own macromolecules. We'll soon see that in addition to RNA, DNA, and polypeptides, which are true polymers formed in condensation reactions, two other important biomolecules, fats and phospholipids, are formed by dehydration synthesis and digested by hydrolysis. And that brings us to the end of this presentation.